Our next witness is Robert C. Enloe, CEO of the Foundation for Educational Choice. Mr. Chairman, good morning. Good Senator morning. Paul, Senator Denham, thank you very much. Denham, Senator Williams, nice to see you again. It's an honor to be here. Um, my name is Robert Enloe, and I'm the President and CEO of the Foundation for Educational Choice. By way of quick background, we're the Legacy Foundation of Milton and Rose Friedman. Uh, Milton Friedman was the 1976 Pro Nobel Prize winner in economics, 1988 uh, National Medal of Honor winner, the Medal of Science winner. Uh, moreover, he uh, clearing the room, it looks like. Um, <laughs> moreover, he was an uh, advisor and president. We all know his reputation was, was stellar, uh, whether we agree or not. Um, in his later years, Dr. Friedman dedicated his life to the simple principle that the best way and most effective way to improve the quality of education in America is to separate the government financing schools from the government running of schools. So we can bring learning back into the classroom, especially for the most disadvantaged, by giving parents greater control over their schooling. Now, I just happened to be in Indiana last night to the world premiere in Indiana, of course, of Waiting for Superman. And I want to answer your question quickly, Senator Denham, Denham and that is, how do we improve the quality of, of options in public school? I think Waiting for Superman gave us a really clear way of doing that. Um, eliminate the barriers and impediments that get in the way of high quality teaching and high quality principles. Uh, and demand high expectations from kids. Get the bureaucracy out of the way of each individual schools. If you look in 1950, there were 155,000 school districts in America. Uh, for uh, today, there are 15,000 or less for a population twice as large. There's a reason why we don't have options in public schooling right now, and that's because the districts have grown so vast that they're unable to serve kids. They can't turn away from the iceberg. So I wanted to make sure I handled that. My, my job here, I've been asked to, uh, as a national organization, in fact, the oldest organization promoting school choice in, in America in 1996 when we started, to give you a perspective on what private school choice, what we've learned about private school choice over the course of the last 16 years. I will try to make my comments brief and would welcome questions. First thing we've learned in the last 16 years is that public school choice, private school choice, and charter schools are on the upswing. Look, in 1996, when we started our organization, there were five school voucher programs in operation in the country. Today, there are 26 programs that operate in 16 states in D.C. When we started, there were 8,000 kids receiving choice and less than 10,000 kids using tax credits. Now, you're looking at 180,000 children receiving vouchers or scholarship tax credits and over half a million families using tax credits or tax deductions to offset private school expenses. In 1996, there were fewer than 500 charter schools. Now, there are almost 5,000 charter schools serving about 1.5 million children. In 1996, virtual schooling was unknown. Now, it's the fastest growing sector. We have a situation where parents and, and schools, we want more options. The polling shows this, and we do polls around the country, and in fact have done 20 in the last four, four years, and have asked the question, if you could choose a, a setting for your child, which setting would you choose? In the, in the beginning, we were seeing just differences between public and private. Now you're starting to see substantial people choosing homeschool, virtual schooling, uh, private school, uh, charter school and public school. So you're seeing a wide set of people wanting a wide diversity of options. As you've talked about, you need to have a, a number of different options in all settings. The second thing we've learned about private school choice is that it comes in all different shapes and sizes, right? So unlike traditional schooling, there is a wide diversity of programs in America. Of the 26 programs in America, four are personal tax credit or tax deduction programs that allow parents and families to offset the cost of private schools, including tuition. Nine are tax credit scholarship programs like the EITC program in Pennsylvania. And 13 are direct subsidy voucher programs for children who attend either failing schools, children from low-income families, or children with special needs. In fact, the fastest growing sector of the voucher market is the special needs voucher market. They've been growing tremendously. In fact, Democratic Governor uh, of Oklahoma signed a bill just this last year for special needs vouchers. All children with IEPs can go to any school. It's an important point. The third thing that we have learned is that the vast majority of empirical research taken as a whole, not just one study or not just one sector, but the vast majority of all the empirical research shows that school choice uh, is absolutely a beneficial thing for the public school system and for our society. Since 1996, there's been a lot of research into what's, what's happening with school choice in terms of uh, parental satisfaction, public school impact, participant effects, 
We now have a solid knowledge of whether parents are satisfied and involved with their child's schools, a good knowledge of whether students do better in school as a result of choice, and whether those schools they attend teach specific values or improve the quality of the traditional public schools. So taken as a whole, this evidence is very clear that, the, that school choice and private school choice is positive. I'll briefly go over all of the types. Parental school choice and involvement. The data on parental satisfaction and involvement is one of the most settled questions in research to date, right? So according to researchers from Harvard, Princeton, University of Indiana, University of Wisconsin, parents who use vouchers are more satisfied with their child's school and more involved with their child's education than their traditional peers. No researcher, no serious researcher, no credible study has questioned that fact. And I want to make this point. If you look at the private sector, they only care about one thing, and that is customer satisfaction. That is the only thing that drives their thing. And it's the exact last thing that we care about in education, is customer satisfaction. We need to think about the importance of parental satisfaction. Civic effects. Another largely settled question about school choice is the impact of school choice on civic effect and democratic values. According to Harvard University's Civil Rights Project, public schools are more segregated than ever before. But the empirical research into segregation and school choice finds that voucher programs put students into a less segregated setting. In fact, there have been nine high-quality studies directly comparing segregation in public schools and vouchers. All nine find that children receiving vouchers attend private schools that are less racially segregated than their public school counterparts. This finding is actually totally consistent with a, a large body of research in terms of the impact of private schools and segregation uh, that has been reviewed by University of Arkansas Professor P Patrick Wolf. Dr. Wolf looked at all of the studies on vouchers and civic values and found that of the 59 studies comparing civic values of private and public school students, 33 found that civic values in private schools were better, 23 found there, were no, there was neutral, and three found better values in public schools. So basically, 95% of the studies find that private school students, choice students are more tolerant and are more, than, their, than their counterparts. You're looking at a situation that choice creates more tolerance. And that's what the large body of research says. Fiscal effects, and another largely settled question here, right? So we've learned in the last 16 years that school choice has had a very positive effect on the fiscal situation in states. Despite the rhetoric you may hear to the opposite, the facts are very straightforward. First. In every single state that has passed a school choice program, school budgets have increased dramatically. They have never gone down. So that's a very clear point to make. Now that, and that's over and above inflation. Second, the most comprehensive study on school vouchers to date was done by Dr. Susan Aud. She found that, quote, no school choice program has had a negative fiscal impact, and most of them have saved significant amounts of money. In fact, her research showed that uh, school choice programs have saved a net total of $22 million for state budgets and $422 million for local school districts between 1996 and 2000. In fact, if you want to get rid of your deficit, I would suggest you take 20% uh, of your students in Pennsylvania, 25%, uh, give them a voucher that's worth half of what you pay now, and you'll eliminate your state deficit most likely, or come darn close to it. The, the other study, this study is also confirmed, Dr. Rod's study is confirmed by a study from the Florida's Office of Program Policy Analysis and Government Accountability, which found that Florida's statewide tax credit program saved taxpayers $38.9 million in 2007-2008 school year. So you're looking at positive fiscal effects. So let's review positive parental involvement and satisfaction, uh, more civic values, fiscal savings. Now the hot, hotly debated topic is, is participant effects. How, how have vouchers impacted student performance? We know in the last 16 years that there have been 10 random assignment studies on school choice looking into the impact of vouchers on student achievement. Now, it's important to talk about these studies briefly because they're, they're using the gold standard of social science research, which is what they call random assignment. It's the pill placebo. It's what drug companies use, right? You get rid of everything in the world except the impact of the pill. This is, this is very rare in social science research. And in fact, no other education reform has been studied with this kind of pill placebo effect except one, and that's class size. And they've only had one study. No other educational reform has had this kind of random assignment studies about it. It's amazing to, to see this level of research. So in all 10 studies, children, particularly children of, of color and particularly children who are poor, who received vouchers had better academic outcomes in math and reading than the control group, than their public school peers. Depending on the study, voucher students outperformed the control group by 5 to 11 points on standardized tests. But again, if you're, some are going to argue that these gains from vouchers are small or moderate. 
But in my opinion, that's not an argument against school vouchers. It's an argument for school vouchers. Think of it this way. If every four years you could guarantee that test scores for low-income children would go up 5 to 11 points for half the cost, I think we'd all do that. That's an important point to make. In the end, the bottom line on educational benefits of vouchers is clear. A large body of top quality research shows that it does have a positive student effect. The last thing we need to talk about in terms of research, what we know is the competitive effects, right? So what have we learned about the impact of vouchers on public schools? Well, here again, we have a, a very high quality body of evidence. To the best of my knowledge, there have been a total of 19 empirical studies examining how vouchers affect academic achievement in public schools. Of these studies, 18 find that vouchers improved public schools and one finds no visible impact. No empirical studies have ever found that vouchers harm public schools. These, there have been studies, five studies of Milwaukee's voucher program conducted by four different research teams, Harvard, Stanford, Federal Reserve Bank, Manhattan Institute, and other institutions, 10 studies of program by five different teams, and studies of Ohio, Maine, and Vermont. The fact is, as we have seen, these studies unanimously say that there's a positive impact. Florida's program, which is a failing school program in which you're considering here today, uh, gave vouchers to, uh, if a child in a public school, attended a public school that failed, that received an F grade for any two out of rolling four year period of time, all the children in those schools were eligible to receive a voucher. So the researchers went in and said, what happens when you look at these F rated schools for the first year? They got one F, they're in danger of losing all their kids if they get a second F to vouchers. The threat, all of them go, right? Those schools improved twice as fast as schools that were C rated or higher. The, eff the effects are obvious. So, in the end, there are a lot of other lessons that we've learned. Bipartisan support for school choices increased dramatically around the country. We've had Democratic governors in Arizona, Iowa, and Oklahoma, and Pennsylvania sign school choice bills. Legislation has been passed in, in majority Democrat-controlled legislatures more. You're seeing a much more bipartisan effect. We also know that choice begets choice. Once a state has passed a school choice program and understand that the myths don't actually happen, uh, more programs pass. Arizona passed a program in 1999, it now has three programs. Ohio passed a program in 1996, it now has three programs. Florida passed a program in 19, 1999, it now has three programs. The fact is, is more, more the states have passed choice, the more they understand that it works. And lastly, and this is an important point to make, programs that have broad income eligibility pools, that have vouchers that are high enough to ensure real choice, do better and are more politically sustainable than those that have small geographic targets or small income pools. It's politically more sustainable, we have found around the country, to have programs that are broad than the programs that are targeted. Um, now, let me put this in a moral way in conclusion, then I'll take questions. Martin Luther King and Milton Friedman have uh, a lot in common, than, much more in common than people might think. King knew that it wasn't just enough for one bus company to change its rules of ridership. And Friedman knew that it wasn't just enough to have one state-run school give parents, state-run school district give parents freedom of choice. They both understood clearly that meaningful systemic reform for everyone comes only when we alter fundamentally the institutional arrangements that separate us as people. They both understood this very clearly. And as Dr. Friedman said, school choice will benefit the very poor most of all and ultimately reduce the stratification of society between the has and have-nots. School choice may not be the magic bullet to fixing all of our ills, but there's absolutely no doubt that it's beneficial to our education system as a whole. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you for your testimony. And uh, let me see if I can summarize. Parents are more satisfied with school choice. Schools that children choose are less segregated. It saves money. The kids do better improves public schools, why would anyone be against this? I, I don't, well, <laughs> you should come on this side because your answer is right. You did it much more briefly. Uh, uh, in my opinion, no one should be against this. In fact, we're not against this in any other area of our life except this one monopoly we have in K-12 education provision. And that's because the institutional arrangements that we set up do not allow for the movement of children that kill children and the migration of children to schools that work. Right? We've allowed the, the quality of your school to be determined by your quality of your home. And that's unacceptable. I think you've hit the nail on the head. Senator Dinneman. Um, can you, um, you stated that one of the difficulties of public schools uh, offering the traditional public school fully being an institution of choice 
is uh, certain barriers. What are those barriers that most concern you? Well, you, you need to eliminate district boundaries as, a, as, a, as an option where people choose, right? So you should have absolutely open enrollment irregardless of where people live. Um, and the sending and receiving districts should not be allowed to deny kids options, right? So what happens now, a lot of states have open enrollment, but the sending district says, oh, I, I'm not going to allow you to go. Or the receiving district says, I'm not going to allow you to come. The fact is, is the money should be strapped to the child's back, as it actually is, for the most part, already, when you move from one public school to another. So we just need to open that much wider. The second thing you need to do is you absolutely need to remove the contract arrangements that are, that are impediments to, to, to principals doing their job and, and eliminating teachers that just aren't working. I mean, if Waiting for Superman showed me anything, um, it showed me the impact of, of quality teaching and education. You know, if one in 2,500 people, teachers in the country have lost their license, that's it, versus one in 87 doctors, I think that should tell us something. Not saying that, now let me be very clear, as a former public school board member and as a former teacher, I have the highest regard for people who get in there and do this work, but we need to be clear about what our consequences are here. So you need to reduce that. You need to open, open the borders up, and you need to get rid of the silly rules around, around all the, the central office. So, for example, uh, how many uh, public school districts won't sell their buildings to charter schools when they're cash-strapped? I mean, these are ridiculous ways that we've set up barriers to children to, to have choice. So those are just three quick ways, sir. No, we appreciate that, and we'll keep searching for those other barriers uh, uh, to eliminate. And in this state, uh, uh, our school code has so many provisions. You know, the school code's this big now. That's right. It started in 1949, and I can never understand how anyone can go into a classroom and try to teach successfully with a code that's this big in rules, regulations, and court, uh, and court cases. Yeah, I've attempted to read it. <laughs> oh, I've fallen asleep too many times reading it. But it's, uh, but, uh, uh, but I mean, we created the very documents, the very institutional arrangements yes. that in some ways are destroying That's right. uh, the possibility for our success in the traditional public school, and, and we need to eliminate some of that. And if you even look at suburban public schooling, it's, this is not just an urban problem. This is a suburban and rural problem as well. So. Thank you. Here, thanks to gentlemen. Senator Williams. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, two quick questions. Thank you, Mr. Enloe, for being here. Um, so, in your vast study of uh, where vouchers, specifically vouchers, not all the other issues, but specifically vouchers, have they ever bankrupted a district, uh, caused severe financial distress to a district, or caused a disruption of any fiscal consideration that specifically pointed to the voucher introduction? No, they have not. Um, if I could add one point, we actually did a study on misconduct in public and private schooling in voucher program states and found that the incidence of misconduct in public schools were higher as a proportion than the incidence of private schools. So, in fact, they're not having, they're not leading to any gaming of the system as a whole as well. So there is a, there's empirical data that we can point to as a result of this hearing to sort of remove the veil of whether vouchers uh, takes away the financial viability. For the those who will say and have said to me at great length, well, um, and I won't even get into the arguments to counter, but <coughs> they will say to me, well, you know, not every parent's going to take a voucher. Mm -hmm. So, and I'll give you an example, Philadelphia School District, of which is about 160 some uh, thousand kids, of which almost 80 to 90 percent of them are Title I. That means most of them are, unfortunately, economically um, uh, modest, uh, to be polite. Uh, they suggest that's not segregated. Uh, but that overlooking aside, uh, they think that then those parents are going to leave even more parents behind. So for some reason, then we're going to have all these other kids that nobody wants or parents don't care about are going to be left behind. Do we have anything that has studied the consequence of that? And, and that's where I think the importance of the Florida study uh, on the, the A-plus program that Governor Bush passed in 1999 is so important because it looks at what happens if, at children in those worst-performing F-rated schools. So even when you have kids leaving, even when your kids don't have leaving, just a threat of vouchers, right, by, by the transparency of the grading system, it improved the quality of the public schools. They were rated F. So the answer to that question is the more, the more you allow migration of children uh, and transparency of grading, the, more, uh, the posit more positive the results are at the public schools where parents might be uh, left behind. I don't believe that's the case, though. And the last two points I would make. One is uh, we're going to have, you know, the stimulus money that we have all benefited by, 
I say we benefit, some say we haven't, uh, benefited by, in large part, sort of propped up our public education in Pennsylvania. That's going away next year. So whoever's governor is going to be faced with making some budgetary costs, cuts. Forty percent, almost 40 percent of our, of our state budget goes towards public education. So whoever's going to be governor has to look at how they fund public education and, and, and maximize those dollars for a quality uh, uh, process for, that parents deserve. Um, vouchers in the bill that I constructed that will inevitably change, uh, one of the underlining principles is that um, there's a financial benefit. Those of us who believe in the moral imperative and those of us who believe in the uh, civil rights considerations, that aside, even if you're not even worried about it, even if your school district is great, the one thing I'm hearing about is taxpayers don't want to pay any more money. Right. Uh, from what I heard in your testimony, and is there, is there empirical data that points to there's a financial benefit that you can do actually cost-cutting without firing teachers. Absolutely. Look, you're looking at $422 million in savings for local school districts with children who leave vouchers. Harrisburg Public Schools, uh, 17674 per student, right? So you give a voucher worth $6,000, right? Now, tell the me. The number's eight, let, but that's okay. Well, sorry? Say the that, number's eight, the eight, but that's So okay. let's say eight. All right, fine. So, so let's see. Um, basic math tells me that that's going to leave somewhere around $9,000 left. Where's that money going? The money has to be left in the local property tax and the local school district. So they're going to not be harmed by this situation. The, the only way you can assume that a public school is going to be harmed fiscally is to assume that all costs for education are fixed costs. And that's just not economically value, valid, right? You, not all costs are fixed costs. And, and I, I will tell you, you're going to face cuts. You know, the federal government is the only institution I know that grew 21.4 percent in the last two years. My organization cut 21.4 percent in the last two, two years. So these are issues you're going to have to face, and, and, and vouchers is one very smart fiscal way to do that, quite apart from the moral reasons which you and I both agree on wholeheartedly. Thank you. And I guess the thing I'll close when I happen to be, a, I, used to be I was in college in 1976, uh, do the math, um, <laughs> and um, 20 then. And I was <laughs> right, and I was required. I was, but I was early, and then, but I. Uh, I was required to read Milton Friedman uh, when he received his Nobel Prize. When I was an economics major, I have a degree in economics, um, and it wasn't until embarrassingly enough, till later years, uh, that I really sort of listened to his comments around choice, options, and vouchers, and what that would mean. I didn't realize he was speaking to me directly, mm. um, and his quote that is in your testimony um, really does ring true with most of us. Um, you know, if you are a believer in the system of government democracy, that means the voice of the people will be heard. And capitalism, money is value. Those two principles encompass what he talks about, parents having real currency. And in this conversation for me, I've said it in cruder terms than he, give parents the cash, systems will respond. Right. Give systems the cash, and parents and children will be sacrificed. That's right. You have to have skin in the game in this country. That means you have to have money in your pocket in this country to make people respond. Uh, it's a harsh and cruel reality, and that's why we want to make sure that these parents have the weight of what they've benefited by or, for, or sacrificed for over these years. I thank you for your testimony. Thank you. And I would say that customer satisfaction, that's why customer satisfaction is the number one thing for private enterprise. Chair, thanks, gentlemen. And the chair is really pleased to hear my Democratic colleague talk favorably about Milton Friedman. <laughs> <laughs> Chair recognized Senator White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Enloe, I'm, I'm interested in hearing about parental satisfaction and public school impact and civic values and fiscal effects, but my bottom line is student achievement and, and improvement. Um, I have in front of me the testimony of the Pennsylvania School Boards Association that was just submitted for the record, and here's what they say. First and foremost, there is no evidence that suggests that students utilizing vouchers make any better progress in private or parochial schools than they did before transferring. Studies conducted in Milwaukee, Cleveland, and Washington, D.C. have reached the same conclusion. Uh, yes, I take it you would take issue with that statement. I think they're not reading the same studies. Uh, the fact is, is the, 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 the studies they're quoting show positive participant effects 
for children, particularly children who are of color and particularly children who are poor. It's, large, it's the largest subgroups. It's not across the board. It's the largest subgroups, right? Those who are getting the best benefits. Let's also be very clear. These studies have found that there is no negative effect. So, so even, even if you take what they're saying is true, you basically achieve the same outcome of public schools for half the cost. Yeah, I'll, but take that. But I'll, I'll take that in a heartbeat, right? I'll take that in a heartbeat. Well, I, I won't because I want the I want the improved performance, not just the reduced. Absolutely, cost. I do, and and, and but, but we know from the majority of these studies that they do serve, uh, they do improve for the largest subgroup, particularly children of color, and particularly those who are poor. So we know that's the case, and those studies that he's quoting are quoting only sections of that case. Right, so the preponderance of the evidence is very clear, and in fact, if we could bring, I wish I could have brought Dr. Wolf or Dr. Green, who actually did those studies, and they would we tell you. We'll do that another Happy day. to, because <laughs> those, guys are, those guys are the ones that actually conducted the study in D.C., and Dr. Wolf makes it very clear that vouchers have had a positive uh, impact on student test scores. And Dr. Green just did a study, and I think this is really important. You want outcomes? Um, the study that Dr. Green just did in Milwaukee found that students who receive a voucher are 12 times more likely to graduate than children who don't receive a voucher. Okay. I mean, that's a huge outcome to me. Yes, it is. I, I just that one point, though, on broad versus targeted. Sure. Um, we heard a lot on preschool education here and on the wonderful benefits of all this early childhood education for, um, for preschoolers. And when I drilled down into some of those studies, I found that they were not universal. They, they tended to measure the most at-risk students, and there was no question that for highly at-risk students, the preschool had beneficial effects that carried into their early uh, K through 12 education. But you seem to be saying that, that broad, the broader pro I mean, why aren't, shouldn't we target the program for the people most at need? Because some students will do very well in any school. You could drop them into any school, and if they're truly motivated and they've got, you know, the family uh, culture behind them of education, those kids are going to be fine. I mean, they, you know, and, and what they don't get in high school, or they'll pick up later. I mean, they're, they're survivors, educational survivors. So why don't we target the resources at the ones who have the who are the most at risk. It is certainly the prerogative of the legislator, legislature to target as you but wish. But I, I heard you say we the, should and the, the reason I would argue to, to make it more broad are two reasons. One, um, political sustainability. If Michelle Reed teaches us one thing, it's to teach, she teaches us that you can't be beholden to the system forever and still expect change to happen over she's time. She's my hero, by the way. <laughs> Michelle Reed's fantastic. If you, and the problem is that she's now resigned, right? Um, and we're, we're da in danger of losing her things. Until you actually strap the money to the child's back and all the children's back, you have a sustainability question. Moreover, you have an implementation question, right? It's frankly more difficult to implement targeted programs, right? It's just that's the way it is. I'm on the board of School Choice Ohio, which is the organization that implements the Ohio Family School Voucher Program. Fantastic program serving 14,000 kids. Would love to have it in any state possible, right? Uh, particularly if you have a once-in, always-in uh, situation where once a child receives a voucher, they're always in. Um, but it has proven a lot of effort, and we've had a lot of private dollars come in to try and implement that program, to reach the families, to reach out and create a systemic constituency. So uh, all I'm saying is, is that you, absolutely, if you want to target, that's fine. But political sustainability and implementation questions uh, might suggest that you could broaden that a little bit and, have a, and not have those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair, thanks to the lady, Senator Fulmer. I'm good. Thank, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate your coming.